Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. My name is Scott Morgan off Motor City Mad Mouth. So please be joined by Justin Rock, no relation to Kid Rock. But Justin, thanks for accommodating us today for the Daytona hat trick that started out with Dick Schofield, Bob Fragol, the owner, and now we go with Justin Rock. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming out to the Jack this day. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having us. It's been an awful lot of fun. You know, it's rare uh, when I get an opportunity to come up to Daytona Beach for anything other than racing and driving through if I have to go somewhere else. But you know what? I was at this ballpark a few years ago, only lasted four and a half innings because Mother Nature wasn't very nice. It wiped us out after four and a half innings, although it was at that time the Tampa Tarpons took on the Tortugas. It was the Yankees in town to take on, obviously, the Reds have maintained the affiliation. But now the night the Miami Marlins Jupiter Hammer has the squad once again takes on the Daytona Tortugas, once again affiliated with the Cincinnati Reds. So tell me a little bit about your background and the road, Justin, over to Daytona. Uh, well, I grew up in uh, New Jersey. I uh, grew up in a small town just outside of New York City and uh, went to Penn State, uh, graduated from Penn State in the fall of 2014. Uh, out of college, uh, actually before I graduated college, got an internship working with the Brevard County Manatees, which is the uh, IA affiliate of the Milwaukee Brewers in this league for a number of years are now defunct. Uh, after I finished up there, went back up, uh, finished my last semester of college, uh, graduated, ended up working two years as an intern with the Tennessee Smokies, the Cubs AA team uh, in the old Southern League. From there, spent two summers working in the Appalachian League, uh, 2017 with the Johnson City Cardinals, 2018 with the Greenville Reds, and that last summer in Greenville uh, helped lead me down to Daytona Beach in 2019. So this is my second season down here. Would have been here in 2020, but obviously uh, the COVID pandemic and other things in mind. And also uh, during the winter, I go back up north and uh, I work at uh, West Point, uh, the U.S. Military Academy as the play-by-play -play broadcaster for their women's basketball team and other various sports that go on there during the course of the winter. If I understand correctly, the Brevard Manatees, they were out in Vero, Florida. Is that yep, right? they were at Old West Space Coast Stadium. Stadium. Right, so since we have a Wisconsin individual as our videography, okay, and it seems like Milwaukee's been the recurring thing because on Saturday we were out at Nashville, Tennessee with our Nashville South. They see a little bit of a Milwaukee twist there. What was that experience like down uh, with the Brevard uh, Manatees and the Milwaukee Brewers? Uh, I mean, it was great. I mean, I was getting my feet wet. I learned within the first couple of days, you never call uh, the manager coach uh, in, in pro baseball. Learned that quickly from our skipper, Joe Ayroll. Um, but it was, it was a great experience largely because it taught me a lot about the business, uh, particularly in minor league baseball, because I was doing a lot more than just play-by-play, -play, media relations. I was doing ticket sales stuff, uh, season tickets. I had to be the mascot. Uh, you know, going to you know public appearances and, and things like that. So uh, I got a real good uh, grasp of you know what it takes to run a minor league baseball team, not just from a broadcast side of things. So I'm able to you know at least be able to help out and understand uh, what my bosses need from me and sort of how everything runs for a minor league organization. So it's a great experience and uh, really helped set me up for the last several years. So when we talk about doing multiple roles and i'm just going to keep a couple in place team broadcaster of course are in the off season you know he obviously is the spokesman for the team and then public relations guy communications lab where you have to come up with the press releases and all that and the roster moves i mean that's one big job that in most cases should really be divided up into two oh uh, yeah i mean it, you sort of got to wear multiple hats uh the phrase in minor league baseball a lot of times is uh, other duties as assigned and uh you know, that's the case. You know, there's a lot of uh, smaller front offices across minor league baseball. Uh, we're not an exception, you know, not just in low A Southeast, but throughout minor league baseball, front offices have you know, sort of pared down a little bit because of the pandemic. And so you have to be ready to do multiple things and uh, be asked to do multiple things in different roles. You know, I've also done graphic design things and, uh, you know, whatever else is sort of asked. I've had to, you know, put together certain stat sheets for, for our coaches as well. Um, but it, you know, it just sort of comes with the territory. Um, you know, try and get as much work done early in the day and be prepared for whatever uh, curveball gets thrown our way during the course of the day. But overall, you know, I really can't complain because you know, the more, in many ways, the more jobs you do, the more uh, things you're you know comfortable with, more things you're acclimated with, and once that's the case, there's more things you can you know present yourself as being able to do 
to not just your own team, but also you know preparing for potentially down the road as I try to climb the ladder as well. Well, you know, it's amazing. You said earlier today when I spoke with the owner, you were born in 1992, is that correct? That is correct. Well, let me tell you, in 1987, folks, I was the director of public relations for the Gastonia Rangers out in the South Atlantic League. Now, I realize that that was like a few years before they even thought about you, but if you've ever heard of Sandy Sosa, Juan Gonzalez, and about 10 other guys that went on to be major leaguers, we lost about 90 games, and I did the public address or something, did the sales, you name it. I know what it's like to wear multiple hats, folks. I respect what this guy is doing. So, you know, I and that's the thing that we understand that in my league baseball, more responsibility is thrust upon you. Yeah, I mean, it's just something you have to, you know, be ready to deal with. You know, there's always going to be something different every day. There's going to be something weird that might happen throughout the course of the day. So, you know, when I try and get home, you know, from the game, you know, I try and do a little bit more work uh, in preparation for the next day before, um, you know, I go to sleep for the night just to, you know, be ready for whatever may happen. You know, there could be a major roster move. Uh, weather could end up being a factor. Um, and there's just so many different things that happen at a minor league ballpark during the course of the day, uh, even before the game, let alone the game itself. So you always got to be prepared, always got to stay on your toes. And uh, luckily, I work with an organization that uh, is uh, very understanding of all the different responsibilities that are not only asked to myself, but uh, my fellow coworkers and teammates here with the team as well. So that always helps to know that, you know, some days are going to be crazier than others, but, you know, they're going to understand why you know, you're doing certain things. As a broadcaster, are there any particular broadcasters that you idolize that you try to take a little style from? You know, everybody has a person growing up. I know with me it was Ernie Harwell for sure, and a bunch of other ones, but Ernie was the guy that I folks went ahead and patterned myself around. And of course, the owner, Bob Motormouth, okay, the guy stealing my thunder earlier, obviously know about Ernie. But what about you, Justin? Uh, I mean, there's so many. Uh, you know, luckily growing up in the New York City area, I had a lot of outstanding broadcasters to sort of follow along. Um, you know, John Sterling with the Yankees on the radio network has an amazing voice. Um, the Mets broadcasters do an amazing job. Howie Rose, Gary Cohen, uh, even when I first started watching baseball, I still had uh, Gary Thorne and uh, the late great Bob Murphy. Uh, and every now and then I'll throw in a little uh, tip of the cap to him, just talking about the happy recap after the game if we win a ball game, because uh, my mom grew up a big Mets fan. so followed along with uh, with that trend. But those guys on the baseball side, of course, the great Vin Scully, uh, the beauty of technology with Major League Baseball.tv, uh, being able to watch and listen to guys like Vin Scully. Um, I think the Reds broadcaster is doing an amazing job, Tommy Thrall and John Sadax in his first year as a play-by-play -play guy there. But on the baseball side of things, you know, you know, really Vin Scully, the Mets and Yankees guys that I listened to growing up, um, you know, definitely have Take little bits and pieces from uh, really all the different broadcasters I listen to. You know, Joe Buck nationally, I think, does a, a fantastic job. Joe Davis is now the guy with the Dodgers. I mean, there are just so many great voices in baseball, uh, even in the minor leagues. Uh, Mick Gillespie, my boss with the Tennessee Smokies, uh, you know, really taught me how to be a, a professional and uh, the way to handle myself, not just on the air, but off the air uh, in this role as a broadcaster. So. Uh, thankfully, there's been so many great voices out there, uh, including the late, great Ernie Harwell, uh, that I've been able to, to listen to and, uh, you know, take bits and pieces here and there, whether it be the way they phrase something, uh, vocabulary, uh, I mean, the list goes on and on, and I'm just very lucky that uh, technology is such that I can listen to so many different people and, um, you know, learn from so many different guys. I think what's so interesting, folks, that was, and I've talked to a lot of young fledgling announcers throughout the course of the summer, and I think the thing you have going for you is not only do you have the audio, but you have everything done through minorleaguebaseball.com. So it looks like your voice and face can be circulated throughout uh, the entire uh, world, the technological world, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful thing that, you know, especially for uh, our players and their families and their friends. I mean, they're from all over the place. We've got kids from as you know, close as you know the state of Florida here and as far away as California. I mean, we've got a kid on our team that, you know, grew up and was born and raised in Italy. Uh, you know, guys from Latin America 
and you know they've got family and friends all over and you know wherever you are on the globe you can tune in and uh, listen to the ball game whether you know the family be on vacation I mean even our owner Bob for goal you know will be listening on his phone and you know he'll call me or, or send me a text message where he's listening to a game from with whether it be friends or just his wife Lori and uh, you know they'll be listening it could be you know out in Europe in 2019 or somewhere else around the state of Florida here in 2021 uh, but you know it's a wonderful thing that you know our broadcasts can be picked up really anywhere you have an internet access 2020 no baseball what did you do um you know tried to find ways to stay busy i mean it was it was a weird weird summer i was about three or four days away from coming down here to daytona beach when uh, i got an email saying you know it was the night after that thunder jazz game where everything sort of started the ball rolling and you know shutting down the country and i was getting ready to send an email the next morning uh to ask you know hey what's the deal what's the plan and before I could even get up and send the email, I had one in my inbox saying, don't go anywhere. And sure enough, you know, that afternoon, Major League Baseball put pause on the season. And sure, within a couple of weeks, you know, the game, you know, the season was put on hold. And, you know, eventually the season was ultimately canceled. So didn't really do much of anything for the first couple of months. The first actual month of April, I was basically quarantined in my apartment uh, for the entire month. Uh, but eventually towards uh, the middle of the summer, once we got towards the end of June, there was a, a makeshift independent league that started uh, in and around our area with three different teams in New York and New Jersey, the, uh, the Rockland Boulders, New Jersey Jackals, and the Sussex County Niners. They had two teams at each three of the three stadiums, and uh, there were games Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I was the official scorer for the Rockland Boulders. So I wasn't doing play-by-play, -play, but I got to spend at least some time uh, at a baseball diamond during the course of last summer, obviously with a mask on and, you know, socially distanced and all that stuff. And it was only about 40, 45 minutes away uh, from where I was staying with my folks in New Jersey. So luckily I still got to spend some time at a baseball park, but not quite in the same role I've been used to over the course of the last seven or so years. A couple more questions I want to ask. I know you got a broadcast to prepare for, but I do know in my mind that the Daytona Tortugas were nearly not the Daytona Tortugas. And if it weren't for the last... Uh, pitch at the effort of your owner Bob and among other things thankfully this organization is playing ball and and thankfully that another organization is I'm not getting any names what are your thoughts about the fact that the Daytona Tortugas are the Daytona Tortugas and are alive and well I mean it's it's an amazing thing I, I'm, I'm so grateful I mean forget about the fact that I still have a job as a result of it but uh, more so for the fans and for the people in and around Daytona Beach and Volusia County. I mean, we have such a rabid fan base that love this team. I mean, you know, there's been changes with the, you know, the level uh, and, and the different rules changes that have come into play. But our fans, you know, it took some getting used to the first month, month and a half of the season. But our fan base has really uh, loved our new guys that have come in through this young group of players that have come through here. And just the fact that uh, the history of this ballpark, you know, this year is starting the second century of minor league baseball here on City Island. I mean, there's so much here. I mean, I'm, I'm just so grateful for the fans that we still have baseball down here. And it's actually kind of funny uh, when the first report came out that they were pairing down minor league baseball's teams uh, and saw that our team was on the list. I was at a friend's apartment uh, in New Jersey and I was actually in the same apartment when I got the email saying that we were going to be a part of the minor league system in 2021. And it was a very confused friend when I threw my phone up in the air and started screaming and told him we were safe. <laughs> we were safe. What's it like to be able to call Jackie Robinson Park home? Um, it, it's special. I mean, it's so fun being able to tell the, the story and the history of this ballpark. I mean, before the season even began, uh, one of my projects was creating a, a running list of all the ball players, major league you know, guys that played here in the minor leagues, whether as a rehabber or on their way up, that ultimately made their way to the major leagues. And there are over 300 some odd names, you know, dating back to the 1920s of guys that came through here, including Stan Musial, who played here as a two-way player as a minor leaguer. He was a pitcher and an outfielder uh, for the Daytona Beach Islanders back in the 1940s. So there are so many amazing players, uh, you know, legends from older times, uh, new age superstars that have come through here. Um, so to have all those different uh, names and different talented people that have come through and be able to tell the story in the ballpark is really something special.
to describe what it's like here in Daytona Beach with this fan base and the energy around the city? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, uh, I was talking with one of our new players uh, the other day, Ruben Ibarro, who was just drafted out of college, and, you know, he got a near standing ovation for a foul ball he hit. And he said, you know, the adrenaline rush he got from the crowd, you know, just cheering something like that was a moment he'll never forget. And it was just a foul ball on, you know, his first game uh, as a member of our team. So to, to have that, you know, crowd reaction, you know, there's quite a few teams in our league, unfortunately, that don't draw a whole lot of fans. So, you know, when we have big moments and have, you know, moments that call for, you know, high anxiety, high intensity, our fans are always there to sort of meet the moment. Even early in the season, we threw a no-hitter when we still had uh, attendance restrictions here. And our entire crowd stuck around. And, you know, it sounded like it was a sellout crowd, even though we probably only had a little over a 1,000 fans in the ballpark. So to have, uh, you know, that crowd noise as the backdrop for my broadcasts, um, I'm incredibly lucky to have uh, this uh, this fan base behind us. Do you guys draw a lot of fans here? Absolutely. We've been, uh, you know, top two, three uh, in the league for, for many, many years. Uh, stays that way here in uh, 2021. Obviously, it's been a little bit trickier uh, trying to market to fans, obviously, because there is very well accepted, you know, trepidations about, you know, just life and being out in public during the course of the pandemic. But, you know, we draw, you know, over a thousand fans every night and uh, more often than not they sound like there are you know twice as many fans here than there actually are so to, to have that kind of uh, knowledge of the game and uh, you know appreciation of the baseball uh, at this level of the minor leagues is, is really something that isn't lost on me. And two final questions here do you ever get a chance to enjoy uh, world famous Daytona Beach? Uh, every now and then you know it, it's a little bit different this year uh, with the you know six days on and then the one day off so that one day off you're trying to you know do food shopping do laundry and do all these different things that you don't have a chance to during the week so my time to explore Daytona Beach isn't quite as much as I would like to uh, but luckily I got a lot of great people that I work with here that uh, point me in the right direction of where to explore uh, when I do have that free time so hopefully I'll get more time to go down to the beach after a season comes to a close but uh, I'm just happy to be here for as much time as I get to be here. Do you live here year-round? Uh, no, I do not. So, you know, when the season ends, my job is a seasonal position. And uh, after the season ends, you know, I'll close up shop here, make sure everything's set with the press box. I'll still do stuff for the team uh, back home in New Jersey, but I will go back up to uh, the Northeast and work up at West Point uh, during the winter, uh, which is about 40, 45 minutes away from where I live. And, uh, you know, do their women's basketball games. I've filled in doing some men's basketball games. Uh, sort of like same thing as you know minor league baseball. Their duties is a sign of them. PA play by play up on cameras. So uh, you know, sort of part of uh, being a minor league broadcaster and being a up and coming broadcaster, you got to go wherever the work is. And whether that's Florida and New Jersey, Tennessee, uh, I've been all over. So I'll go wherever the job is. And for now, you know, I have it backwards. I come down to Florida when it's sweltering hot during the summer and go up north when it's freezing cold in the snow. But uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. How, how do you enjoy working with the Cincinnati Reds? Uh, it's amazing. I mean, this the organization has been so good to me uh, from the media relations standpoint to uh, people on the player development side, uh, the people who are just, you know, working in, you know, assistants and, you know, administrative roles with the organization. You know, they've been great to me. And, of course, the players and coaches are just outstanding uh, young men and women. And I, I, they make my job so much easier to deal with. I mean, as you saw with Dick Schofield, just right. walked in there and, you know, said, hey, Dick, someone wants to speak to you. And he was out there within five minutes, ready to go. Um, so when you have that sort of relationship and, you know, they understand that I'm not going to put them in any spots that are going to make them uncomfortable or make them look bad and vice versa. Uh, that's really all you can ask for, especially in a year like this, where, you know, the first couple months of the season, my face-to-face -face interaction with them was on a minimal basis. So to still have that level of respect between one another, even though I'm not around them quite as much as I would be in years past, uh, says a lot to the kind of people uh, that the Reds have in the organization from the coaching side, player side, and then, of course, on the front office and administrative side as well. And finally, you're living your field of dreams. What were your thoughts about what happened last night with the Yankees and the White Sox and that field of dreams? I mean, it was it was very cool. It was you know, great to see the reaction for baseball. I saw it was like the most watched regular season baseball game in, you know, almost, you know, a decade and a half or something like that. 
Um, so to see all the attention uh, brought to baseball and to see the excitement, not just from the fans, but from the players on the Yankees and the White Sox as well, uh, was you know pretty special. And you know, growing up a big baseball fan and growing up around diamonds and you know going to games at you know Yankee Stadium and Chase Stadium, just to see the enthusiasm uh, for baseball in a part of the country that doesn't get a whole lot of uh, Major League Baseball games is fantastic. And you know, you know, back in the olden days, 20s, 30s, there were barnstorming tours, and hopefully, maybe this is the start of a new trend of you know reaching out into different parts of the country that maybe don't get an access to major league players as often to you know continue to do things like that to you know reach out to smaller communities and i think that's great well justin i can't thank you very much for hosting us here tonight it's been a real privilege to be around a guy who certainly tried to break in but you know you wear a lot of hats and you've demonstrated so much class especially since we got in touch so i really enjoyed the time that we've had a chance to really get a feel for this organization and look forward to spending more time with you in the future you know i, I realized to me this will always be the florida state league i don't care if it's low way or not florida state league folks scott morgan roth along with justin rock here live from daytona beach florida the home of the daytona tour tugas the affiliate of the Cincinnati Reds. Once again, Justin, thank you very much for joining us on this edition of 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. Thank you, buddy. My pleasure. Thanks for coming out. Thank you.